partnered with Broken City Lab, and Justin is actually going to introduce our guest. And thanks, Justin, for bringing Jen Gibbs Race to Windsor. Perfect. Well, thanks a lot to the School for Creative for Arts and Creative Innovation and to the Ontario Trilling Foundation for allowing us to do this. I'm really happy to uh, introduce and welcome Jen Del Estreas. She is an assistant professor at Portland State University where she teaches in the Art and Social Practice MFA, and, the MF and she's the coordinator and co-director. She is originally from Winnipeg, Manitoba, and her research interests include uh, the history of social engaged art group work, band dynamics, folk music, and artist social roles. She has exhibited works across North America and Europe, and she's contributed various writings to catalogs and institutional publications. She's received numerous grants and awards, including uh, a Social Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada grant. Jen is also the uh, founder and director of Open Engagement, which is a conference on socially engaged art practice, and she herself speaks widely on art and social practice at conferences and institutions around the world. As I said, she's currently an assistant professor at Portland State University, and I'm really uh, happy to say that there's also an exhibition up at Civic Space, which is a 411 Plisher in downtown Windsor, and we're showing a lot of work that she's done in collaboration with students and guest artists at PSU. And uh, there's a little bit of an opening reception tonight at 7, and there's also, Ziggy is doing Infuse at, uh, in the basement of Lampton Tower, Studio A, at 7.30, so you could literally do a couple of things tonight, <laughs> lots going on. But without further ado, let's uh, welcome Jen up. and then reading a prepared lecture. So a little bit of both kinds of styles this afternoon. So to talk about myself, I really like starting with this quote from the Beach Boys, that was the song when I grew up to be a man from today, 1965. And he asks, well, I think the same things that turned me on as a kid. And I really feel when I reflect on what I do now, as an artist, it's really very much the same thing that I engaged in when I was a teenager in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and highly invested in the music scene there. I was a show organizer, I played in bands, I was in the zine culture, and just operating mostly as an organizer. And when I think about what I'm doing today, it's really quite similar. It's about building a scene, reorganizing a conference. Um, I contribute regularly to publications. I'm really big on building a discourse around the things that I do. And then just um, creating what I like to refer to as a resonating body of work, which I'll share a quote in just a minute. It should be sure two quotes that I really like. And this one relates to why it is that I think I personally gravitate so much towards group work and why band dynamics are so interesting and integral for me and why I continually go back to those sorts of structures in my own practice. And it really, um, it feels like it's the same kind of feeling as when you play, I how many people play in band or have played in bands in this room? Yeah, there's something really magical about when people come together and are able to make a song happen. And I think that um, throughout making work, realized that I was missing that and continually tried to find ways to get that back into my art practice. So, this is from Joe Strummer from Clash. 
I think that people love rock groups more than solo artists, maybe because there's something fantastic about four people being able to meld together in that way and move forward in one direction. Because that's hard enough with two people, never mind four, and mathematically it must be increasing the chances of arguments by millions every time you add another person to the unit. And so people like to see that because it makes us think better of ourselves as a species. <laughs> and then this second quote that I'm going to share is um, by Jan Herbert. And this is actually him reflecting on the work of Anton de Gogol. A body of work that offers something to others to share is a resonating body that makes the voices of many others resound. Yet for <coughs> echoes and resonances to become audible, someone, I believe, has to make a sound play a tune, or lay down a rhythm. Someone has to start playing. One thing presupposes the other. For one voice to be a voice, it takes many to give a sound. And for many voices to resound, it seems it takes a resonating body to make them audible. So when I think about this in relation to the work that I do, things like open engagement, or creating even exhibitions like the one that's at uh, civic space right now, I feel like that's something I continually do a lot in my practice, is make space for the voices of others to be heard and to create a type of work that really elevates what other people are doing and highlighting those things. So it's a lot about laying down a foundation and opening up space. So, I'm going to talk about some past projects. This is a piece from 2005 and it's called The Lovers, The Dreamers, and Me. And it's from a series of work that I was doing that was really reliant on technology and sensors to be able to tell when a group of people was assembled in a space. So you would walk into this gallery, it's a fairly dark space, and you would see seven stools in an arc in front of this video projection of these seven colored dots. And what would happen would be that when seven people sat down, there were weight sensors on the stools, and it would then trigger a video to play in the space. And the video that played was a series of colored swatches that would project over the backs of the seated individuals, thus making them part of the image. And the swatches of color were timed to sync up to Willie Nelson's uh, rendition of Kermit the Frogs, The Lovers, The Dreamers, and Me. Another piece that was in a similar kind of vein was called I Am A Rock, playing off of the title of the Simon and Garfunkel song, same name. And it was four beanbag chairs in this space, uh, each connected to a discman that was playing one isolated track from that song. So one would be just drums, one would be just vocals, one would be just uh, guitar, and so on. And then when four people were seated and the headphones had sensors in them, and when they were all being used, and they were listening to the isolated tracks, they would then create, uh, well, it would trigger the whole song to be heard in the space, unified. So I stopped doing work like this rather quickly, because I really found that it didn't illustrate the things that really interested me about group work and group dynamics, and that is that it's not as easy as these pieces make it out to be. It's not uh, not like flipping on a light switch, all of a sudden something happens. It's complicated, it's messy, it's difficult, and that's really where a lot of interesting things lay for me, is in the process of making something happen as a group. So this was really the last time that I did work like that, and from there, tried to figure out these other more social sorts of situations that had me working with groups of people to make things happen. Um, I started doing these choir pieces in 2008, and they're called Choral Society and then parentheses, whoever it happened to be for. And this was based on an experience that I had the year prior where I went to the funeral of um, one of my close friend's grandmothers. And while I was there at the service, they had organized that we would all sing her favorite song together. Because music was such an integral part of her life, and um, it was really moving. And I just really had wished in that moment that this was something that had been organized for her while she was still alive. And so from then on, I decided that um, for people that I was either uh, 
working with or that I cared about were friends with in some way that I would organize a series of these choirs where I would find out their favorite song and then organize a group of their friends and family and their loved ones to come together and then sing the song for them. And so this happened at a show at Ampersand International Arts, and it just happens to be that the curator of that show is one of my closest friends, her name is Lori Gordon, and her favorite song was John Lennon's Instant Karma. So we sang that for her at the opening. And then this was another iteration of that project that happened the same year in Calgary for Art City, and uh, I organized it for you know, Wednesday Look at You, and her favorite song is Madonna's Into the Groove. So another music-related project, this is one from 2009, and it's called Remaking Rumors, um, and it's based on the Fleetwood Mac album Rumors. So a little bit of music history. In 1975, Fleetwood Mac released their self-titled album in their most famous configuration of the band. They had actually released a lot of albums before that, but it wasn't the lineup that we know them as now. With Nick Fleetwood, John P, Christine P. Lindsay Buckingham and Phoenix. And so their first album together, Cleveland Mac, insanely successful. Really great um, thing happened there. However, in like, the following year, a lot of things broke down within the band, personally. Um, the, the couple that were married in the band, they were getting a divorce. Lindsay Buckingham, the drummer, was also getting a divorce. And then Stevie Nicks um, and thinking of um, yes she was having a relationship I can't remember with who in the band but then they were also breaking up so there's a lot of really bad uh, interpersonal dynamics happening and they probably didn't want to see each other at all but the label was really pressuring them to get back into the studio to record a follow-up because the first one was so successful so I don't know if anyone's ever had to record an album or a song, but it's a really high pressure, really intense situation in which you're with a group of people in a small space for hours and hours on end. And I could just not think of a worse situation than being in that space with someone that you just broke up with, or the person that you're going through a divorce with, but that's what they ended up having to do. And so um, in 1976, they recorded rumors and who here is, is everyone familiar with the content of that album? Yeah. So you all know that they were working through a lot of their issues that they had with one another through that album. And just a, a funny side note too, is they recorded the album and then um, something happened and they lost it and they had to re-record it. As if that wasn't bad enough, they had to go through the process twice. So I was really interested in the content of those songs and how they were really about these intense uh, inner workings and relationships. And I thought, I wonder if that could really add to a dynamic of a group of people getting to know each other and then being brought into a studio space to then record those songs with people that they didn't know. And so that was what I set up at uh, Haverford College, is that I had, um, they had this defunct recording studio there that hadn't been used since the 70s. Um, and they, they used to have a label, a student label called Black School Records. And when I was invited to do a project there, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. And then one of the people I was working with mentioned that they had this recording space, but that no one used it anymore. And so we decided we would kind of take up that mantle, reopen it up as a studio, and brought in new equipment. Of course, they didn't have any equipment, but it was still set up to, um, to be the sort of a recording area. And then they had a booth. And so, we got a list of about 50 different individuals who wanted to be paired with strangers to re-record a track from rumors. And so over the course of two weeks, we grouped people together, um, and they had all signed up for specific songs that they wanted to do. And then they had recording sessions that lasted maybe about, I think about four hour blocks, and they would bring them in, record, and then bring them back in to then mix and master later. And I really love the fact that what ended up happening through this project is that this is now something that the students are using, and they've restarted the Black Squirrel Records label, and now they're recording local bands from Bryn Mawr College and Harvard College, and um, it's still being used, so that's kind of a nice outcome. 
So this is a project from 2009 that was done at the Dunlop Art Gallery, and it's called Neighborhood Chorus. And the Dunlop Art Gallery is a gallery, actually they have two locations, both located in, the, um, in public libraries. And this one is their Sherwood Village branch. And so it's located in this really residential area. And I was invited specifically to try and figure out what I would do that would maybe connect some of the people who live in that neighborhood and use the library, but maybe never use the gallery space or never go into the gallery space. And I decided that what I wanted to do was connect the residents through music. And so I'd asked the curator, which he was very accommodating, although this is completely not in his job description to do, to go around the neighborhood with a music survey that I had created. And so he was going door to door and conducting these surveys around music. And one of the questions on the survey was to list all of the favorite songs of people who live in their household. And so then what I did was I went through those surveys and um, picked four different households and then assembled four different choirs to then learn all of the songs that those individuals selected. And then later that summer, um, unbeknownst to them, we would show up at their front door with this choir and then we would sing their favorite songs to them. And there was a really wide range of people picked things all the way from Bruce Springsteen songs to the Beach Boys to the Weaker Men. Another music related project, this is a more recent one, it was called the Manitoba Folkways Collection. And it was a collaboration with Carrie Lynn Reeves, a Winnipeg based, or I should just say, Manitoba artist. And it was based on the work of Alan Lomax, who was a really famous. Uh, American folklorist and ethnomusicologist, and he was one of the best folk collectors um, that was in operation. And him and his father really elevated vernacular music in America, and because of them, things like Muddy Waters got recorded, and all of these amazing people that maybe otherwise would not have been recorded um, were then on the record. And they really, at that time, people's music wasn't looked at in the same way as professional music, and they really made that something that was of value, and their approach was really different than a lot of the other people operating in their field, which it's funny because at the time they were really criticized for, and people felt like those standards that they had weren't standards that needed to be in the field. Like Something I really like about John and Alan is that they never went into, into a small town or village with this idea that they were professors in the search of the quaint, they always said that they went to make friends first, and only then would they ask for music or collect songs. So they really built relationships with people and tried to understand a place and live in a place before they even thought that they could begin this task or duty of recording people's history through music. So throughout um, the like, 50s and 60s, I think even into the 70s, Alan Lomance was really um, on this big world music collecting spree. I think it was through Columbia Records, and they put out an amazing series of records. And I really was um, struck by those. But what was kind of saddening was to find out that he wasn't always the one doing the collecting. There was only a few places where he actually went to be able to, because it was such a large undertaking. And with his approach, he couldn't possibly do that. So. A lot of people um, he hand selected to, to pick the songs in a certain area, people he knew through his you know, professional activities. And he never did come to Canada. He never collected folk music here. And I, I just think that what he did for American culture was so interesting in terms of how it solidified a sense of identity there. And sometimes I think, like, well, and I think a lot of people ask, what is the Canadian identity? And I, I wondered if through maybe folk music had it been done in a different way, maybe we would have found something else about who we are as a people. Um, and so I thought it would be an interesting project to try and take that up now and what it would be like to travel across the province and meet people who maybe don't consider themselves musicians, but who are writing folk music. And for me, I'll define folk music as um, any music that's written about your life experience or the place in which you live. It's, about, it's more about content than it is about a sort of genre or style of music. And so over the course of two summers, 
drove across the province, he met individuals, and recorded their music, and then released uh, NLP. And then one more Alan Lomax related project. This one was also from a few summers ago. <coughs> it was at Ditch Projects in Springfield, Oregon, and it was called School of the Air Band Class. And this played off of a program that he did for the CBS called School of the Air. Um, and it was, I think, based on Wisconsin College, um, their College of the Air. And so he was really looking at popular radio as a tool for education and wondering how you could tap into that. And it's actually a really successful program. Like, I think it ran every day for a few years, from 2.30 to 3.30, and schools across America would actually use this, you know, time to turn on the radio, and he would be documenting American history, an emergent American history through the music that he was collecting, and it's very place-based. So, I decided that I was going to do a version of School on the uh, School of the Air, but focused on some of my own interests around group work through music. So it was four weeks of podcasts, as well as the sort of um, resource room, classroom that the gallery was set up to be. And the four areas that I looked at were work and play, union and protest, music, bars and acapella, and then the last week was focused on bands and groups. <coughs> And these podcasts are still available online, and you can get them from my website if you're interested in that. OK, so a large amount of my time is spent organizing an annual conference called Open Engagement. And the first time it happened was in 2007, and it was while I was finishing up my grad school education. And I was in a place that both geographically and both maybe also just mentally feeling like I was disconnected from a lot of the people and ideas that I wanted to be connected to. And instead of being frustrated by the situation, I decided that I would just create the situation that I wanted that would bring these people to me. Uh, and that we would have this sort of conversation around what it is to make socially engaged art right now. And so this first iteration of the conference brought over 70 presenters from around the world focusing on three different uh, primary questions that I have currently in my own work. And there was a lot going on. Um, I was also really interested in the form of the conference and had been going to conferences over the past couple of years just, just as research and feeling like it didn't ever really create the space that I felt like a conference was supposed to create, that I was actually meeting people in my field, that I was conferring with my peers, that it was this really great social environment where we were coming together and things felt like that they could happen. Um, a sad example is uh, the CAA, yeah, College Art Association conferences, which for some reason every year they plan them to happen over Valentine's Day weekend. It's like this, that's the time every year. And so I went to one that was in New York, and it was, it was actually Valentine's Day, and I was in the hotel restaurant, and I had my dorky name tag on, and I was sitting alone having dinner and seeing there's like all these other people doing the exact same thing. And I just thought, this is why aren't we eating dinner together or doing something together? And it just didn't feel like that was the kind of environment that was fostered. And so, I was really looking at how the conference model itself could be more social, how, especially since it's a group of people coming together to talk about work that they do that engages communities and work socially, that it just made sense that the form itself should reflect that. And so hospitality plays a big role in our conference every year. Um, every year we send out a team of people to welcome presenters, a welcoming committee, at the airport, the train station, the bus depot, wherever they're coming in, we're there to greet them. We also try to billet people to together with a local host that we feel like that's a connection that they should really make while they're in town. And those have been really uh, successful, as well as building in the spaces within our own event where people, for example, uh, get to know each other, that they're introduced. This was the first um, version of that, and it was done by Michael Tanaka, who's a really great curator and artist. She's currently in Toronto. And this one was called Three Cheers. So one part of the project was that she organized 
what she wrote um, three different years that reflected the different thematic explorations of the conference, and she would start each day with this big rally, doing the cheer together as a group. And then, but what I love that she did on the first day was that she did a roll call of everyone who registered to attend the conference. And so she would call your name, and then you would come up to the front of the crowd that was assembled, and um, everyone would cheer. Another thing that's really important for me about the structure of the conference is that it reflects different ways of learning, and different modes of um, knowledge production as well, that it's not just someone sitting there and delivering a, a paper, which I will do, but uh, that there are these other ways of being and knowing and that we really try to have more hands-on embodied experiences as well as have the conference the site where projects manifest and happen. That it's not just talking about past work. So uh, social networking also is something that's really important in building the opportunities for people to do that. This was a project called uh, Field of Thoughts Bingo, and it was by the group Future Farmers, so based in San Francisco. And it was, it was really amazing. They set up this bingo card, and on the bingo card, each of the spot where there's usually numbers was an image of someone who was at the conference. And so they would do this sort of call where they would pick out a number that was associated to someone's image. And then when they would pull that, how you would be able to put that down on your bingo card, get it, was you would have to get up and tell a story about an interaction that you had with them. And then this was um, the sort of a physical networking exercise where they had asked, I think it started off where you had to find someone who was there that you had a connection with before the conference and start there and then they asked a series of questions that then eventually led to the fact that everyone ended up having a hand on someone's shoulder. So in 2010, at this point I had been in Portland, Oregon for two years and almost would be the second year that I was there and was teaching in this MFA program and was really interested in being able to use the conference for the graduate students very similar to the way that I had just used it a few years prior to that, that it would become a vehicle for them to connect with people that they were really interested in, how they were working, that they would explore the questions that they were asking as artists in this MFA program, really questioning what it is to make social engagement art in today's world. And so the first version of the conference that happened in Portland was in 2010, and the main areas of exploration were uh, making things. So this idea of like, where does the object um, fit in social engaged art practices? Is it still an object-focused kind of way of making, or is it something different that's not relevant? Making things better, looking at this idea of should socially engaged art have the responsibility of doing good in some way? And then this idea of making things worse. Is, is there a way of doing these sorts of projects that just aren't beneficial or that are um, intentionally problematic? I think people like Santiago Sierra, that's the first person that I think of in terms of the, doing a social-based project, which is all about pointing out that social injustice or inequity and, and really I'm not doing anything to improve it. I wouldn't draw attention to it. So lectures, many lectures. I think that year we probably doubled in terms of numbers of people who were coming in to present. Um, had over 120 presenters that year from all around the world. So this is Nils Norman, who's one of our keynote presenters. He runs a really interesting school in Denmark, at the School of Walls and Space. I recommend it. If you don't know about his work, it's really interesting. Um, we also really that year. We're very excited about bringing together different educators from the programs that were emerging in the US focused on social practice or public practice, however you want to refer to it. And so this was a panel that had some of those individuals and students who did it. There's Ted Purvis on the far left there. He was at the time directing the social practice MFA at CCA and some of his students. And then since then, um, we continue to make that a big part of the conference and sort of having this discussion where we can bring together some of the different schools like CCA, Otis, they have a public practice program that's led by Suzanne Lacey. Uh, Micah has a community arts program. Tom Finkel Pearl, Gregory Chalette, and a few others 
Corey O'Connor, they just started a program in New York, a social practice program, an MFA that's a collaboration between the Queens College and the Queens Museum. And so just having that space to be able to have those discussions around what it means to be in these sorts of programs and to teach this way to motor working. Um, this was a fun project that was instigated by some Chicago folks. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the work of Incubate, some radical arts administrators from Chicago. Um, they organized this project called Pilot Studies, in which they were looking at emergent sort of forms of creating work and um, doing this sort of a series of case studies around how those things were able to happen. And then there was also a show of the group Temporary Services publication that came out that same year called Artwork that was really reflecting on art and the labor and the economy. And then things ended with a um, a really raucous discussion trying to trace a lineage of socially engaged art making that was led by Nato Thompson. So the next year we had the same sort of things in place. We always have a lot of committee. Um, that year we had Fritz Haig as a keynote presenter as well as Julie Alt from the group, group material. And then who else was there that year? Pablo Helguera. The fabulous Pablo Helguera was also there. And this was the final discussion we had um, that was moderated by Wicklow Project Grow House. And I'm going to get back. I'm going to share a quote um, from Pablo about um, socially engaged art and education that I think is really important. Pablo, and I should make a note too of how the conference is integrated into the teaching structure, is that um, every year the students select who these keynote presenters are, and these keynote presenters then are also teachers in our program. And so the students vote on who these individuals are, and they teach classes. And actually the class that Pablo taught um, that year led to a book that he released the next year called Education for Socially Engaged Art, and that's what I'll be sharing the quote from. And then just a little bit from last year, we had a really amazing talk by Stephen Wright, the great arts critic and theorist. And this is actually online. It's been transcribed. It's on um, the PSU Art and Social Practice Journal. If you haven't read it, I really suggest you do. It was pretty mind-blowing. It's incredible. Uh, this was a different sort of approach that we took. So every year, it's an open call as to who can present. We usually release our call for uh, submissions in January, and then submissions are due. No, is that right? No, that's not right. We release our call in October, and then they're due early January, and then we plan for, for the spring. But this year, we decided that we would have an additional open structure in which people could sign up to the ad hoc and do these 15 minute presentations in a separate space as well. And then there were also a series of um, activities that happened outside of the traditional lecture or presentation format. This was an urban ecology tour that was led by Keith there, who's going like this. And he was a PhD candidate at the time and well of knowledge about urban ecology and urban and then this year, lots to look forward to. Uh, the conference is going to happen May 17th through 19th. And we have a, a bevy of interesting keynote presenters. Tom Finkel-Coral, the director of the Queen Museum, the Prince Museum, and someone who's written extensively about public art is going to be speaking at the conference, as well as Claire Doherty, a UK-based scholar who's written a lot on this idea of the shift from a studio-based practice to a situation-based or context-based practice. And then Michael Rafflewitz, who's just done a lot of really interesting, interesting work in, in public space. So I hope some of you will be able to join us in Portland for that. And the three areas that we're really looking at this year, um, each very much connected to each of those presenters. So we're looking at um, publics, contexts, and institutions. Those are the sort of framing. So, um, the conference, like many of my activities, 
are centered around the MFA program at USU. And I direct that program with Carol Fletcher, and I've been there since late 2007. And it's a program that is really very connected to our ideas around radical pedagogy and democracy in the classroom. So as I alluded to, there's a lot of voting that happens. Students have an equal say to faculty on almost all, all matters, including taking visiting lecturers, who, who the faculty is directing the conference, selecting incoming students is something that um, they really are the ones who are steering that ship because they have an equal vote to the two of us, and so it makes it an 18 to 2 vote. And it's really, it's so important because you learn as much from your peers as you do from your educators. And it also has been something that's just created such a supportive system of um, students who are really invested in the work that each other uh, what they're doing. So, I don't know about other reading these, but we are definitely a program that is not studio based. Students make their work out in the world. They're encouraged to find uh, organizations and individuals to partner with as well. We also create those sorts of opportunities for students to create that kind of work. And I'll talk about some of those sorts of initiatives too. Students do learn about a variety of working artists as well as non-artists who have engaged in civic activity to apply their knowledge and abilities to initiate, develop, and complete projects with the public, individuals, groups, and institutions. And social practice might appear to be more like any of these other things, sociology, anthropology, environmentalism, than uh, more traditional ways of art making, yet it still retains that same intention of creating appreciation and meaning for audiences in a similar way to more conventional art. And so a day in our classroom might look like a lot of other things that maybe doesn't appear to be learning, like mushroom hunting, or rooftop urban yoga, a pipe organ demonstration, which this was incredible, by the way. We got to get behind there. There's a door. This thing was massive. Being inside of the pipe organ is bigger than this room. It's so crazy. And then context-based, site-specific learning. So this was a visit to an exhibition of the work of Sister Farida Kent. Really such an incredible inspirational figure. And um, I'm on the far right, and I'm holding a book that I did by Julie Alt, and it was called Come Alive, the Spirit of Art of Sister Rita Kent. And so we went to the space, and we did a reading of, uh, from that book at the exhibition site. And then we also foster a space for uh, critical learning, theory, and reflection, and really connecting to a lot of the different books in the discourse that is emerging around social art. So as I mentioned, students in our program don't have uh, studio spaces. But one of the things we do have is field work, which is a downtown urban classroom that's been donated to us by the Portland Development Commission. And in that space, we activated for um, actually really more public to what civic space does, public talks, exhibitions, workshops, skill shares. Those sorts of things all happen, and it's important for us to have a site that was like this, that was very publicly visible. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about the history of that kind of storefront based way of working as a social media artist later. And then just a few examples of projects that we've done together as, um, as a program. This was something that happened at the uh, Salon in Paris. And what, it was actually part of the series that they were doing, they did over the course of a year called Partie Prenante. And they, sorry, I forgot the culture in French, but they invited a series of different programs focused on social engaged art to come out to the space and do a month long residency where the educators and their students would then engage with neighborhood and uh, surrounding communities. So this was a gallery space that's at a university. And I think what really prompted this line of programming was that the year before, there was a series of student protests, and one of the most contested sites was the gallery space. And they did this um, long sit-in in the space saying that that was an elitist space, that it didn't serve the university, that it wasn't serving the community. And they were really using that as a site um, to have this sort of discussion. 
And so following that, they decided that through their own curation and programming, they would try and address some of those concerns. And so these different schools, so Tanya Bergera and her, her school was invited out. I went out with Harold and my students. Let me think about who else was included. Um, it's not coming to mind right now. But so what we ended up doing was this series uh, called Info Point, where we met different people in the neighborhood that had uh, knowledge that they wanted to share and that they were experts in their own right. And then we created these information sort of boards and then had a really big info session in which people would give talks. And then throughout the time, people could connect with these individuals in their neighborhood who shared that they knew. Uh, Dominic over here was a huge fan of the Three Musketeers. And he did a fencing demo, as well as talk about his love for the book. That gentleman right there was someone that Harold met who um, knew a lot about foraging. And so he did a tour, an urban foraging tour, in which he identified all of the plants in that neighborhood <coughs> that he could eat. OK. And then this was a show that we were in at Smack Mellon in New York. And it was called, Let, well, our contribution is called Let Knowledge Serve the City, which is actually a, a PSU phrase that is held up. And what we did there was we identified sites of learning in the Dumbo neighborhood where the gallery was located. And so when you would go to the gallery space, it would basically just point you to go back out into the neighborhood different sorts of areas where there was people, there were people who were um, willing to share a scale or teach you something. And we also brought some of those individuals into the gallery over the course of a couple of weeks to get these same sorts of workshops. And then those flags that you saw, those are the markers that were also out in public so you could make that directly. So an ongoing collaboration that we do is called Shine the Light. And this happens at the Portland Art Museum every year. It's now in its fourth year, and it's a series of interventions into the museum's collection. They're instigated by our students and faculty that really rethink how people can be in the museum, rethinks who the museum is for, how the museum is used. And um, I, I can say that I usually hate to, to play a numbers game, like numbers is what makes something successful, because I really think that successful social media projects that have two people can be a huge success. Um, but it does make me feel really good that this is the highest attended event that the Portland Art Museum does every year. Two to three thousand people come out for this um, over the course of the past from 6 p.m. to midnight. And it's that gets more attendance than their free monthly day. And um, why I think that that's important is that it tells me that people actually want to be with art in a different way, that they want to experience art in these sorts of unconventional ways, and that the museum is a place that people want to be. It's just maybe not part of um, their everyday strategy that the museum uses. This is also something that's put on through the education department. So I think that that's really interesting, that that's really we spearheaded this, this initiative. So I'll talk about a few of projects that have happened over the years. Here's, um, here on the left, you see a portrait of Hearst Stein Woods, one of CES Wood. And this painting is located in the Northwest collection at the museum. And so Erskine has a really interesting and rich history connected very much to his father, whose history is also very complex and connected to the Esther's tribe. And, and um, Helen Reed was the artist who did this project, and she decided that she was going to organize a tour of the Northwest collection that specifically came out of Erskine's life. So to look at those sorts of objects and then connect them to his own story. But there were a few caveats. One, you could only go on a tour if you were uh, the same age or less as Erskine was when this portrait was painted. And then the children who went on the tour had to somehow embody his, his life experience a little bit. So that's why you see the children all in these black dickies. And then they had a, a professional face painter there painting them to look similar to the way Erskine did. And then on the bottom here, you'll see this project um, where there are these individuals holding that. 
it was a project by um, Hannah Jickling, and it's called Orienteering Museum. And she worked with the Columbia River Orienteering Club to create a map of the museum based on an orienteering style map. And so you would then be able to explore and navigate the museum in this more unconventional way that you would maybe that you would be using to navigate wild unknown territory. And like an orienteer, and you would have to find the series of controls based on the map, navigating this map throughout the museum. A few other projects, and um, the top one there where someone is, is receiving a mole, that was a mole service. <laughs> and that, that happened in, in any gallery where you would see a, a lady like that. And that was also a project that Hen and Reed had spearheaded. On the bottom here, this was one of my favorite projects. It was called Serenades, and it was organized by Ariana Jacob. And she was really, she was someone who's really interested in intimate relationships and conversations. And she invited a series of Pacific Northwest musicians to select a piece in the museum's collection that had meaning to them, and then to write an original song for that piece. And then on the night of Shine Light, uh, they serenaded the work. So that's Honey Owens from the group ballet serenading that piece that is behind her. Uh, there were a few really popular musicians that were in fire drill. <laughs> And then on the right here, you'll see that there's this plastic cast, and one of the first acquisitions of the museum was this series of Greco Roman casts. And um, I just don't want us to be in danger. <laughs> I don't mind. Okay. And so artist Jason Zimmerman took this piece from the museum's collection as the inspiration to then invite these two men to wrestle nude in a Greco Roman fashion uh, throughout the night. And it was very popular. <laughs> male wrestling. <laughs> All right, so no, oh, I have a few more pieces. Oh, some of you probably are familiar with Jason Sturgill, who was just here. He did a project at a Civic Space called Windsor is Forever. And the first iteration of that project was done at the Portland Art Museum in 2011. And you can see an image from it on the top right. And it was called Art is Forever. And what he had done was he invited a series of illustrators and had two artists to create flash art based on objects in the museum's collection. And then throughout the entire day of Shine a Light, people were um, able to get a tattoo for free of, of something from the museum's collection. Okay, on the top left here, we have a piece by Molly Sherman. And it's called The Museum Visitor, and it plays off of the Dwayne Hansen sculpture on the left there, which is called The Dishwasher. So what she did was she built an identical plinth. She got an identical wire milk crate and cushion and set up this platform for museum visitors to emulate the, the sculpture, very realistic sculpture on the left. Bottom right uh, is a piece that was a collaboration by artist Lexa Walsh and professional cheerleader Stephanie Drachman, in which they wrote cheers together for pieces in the museum's collection that they felt were maybe unpopular or needed a little bit of a, like a boost. And the night of the event, Stephanie, in her full cheerleading regalia, went around and performed the cheers. And then this was a project that I did called WPAM, or Art Museum Radio, in which people could request uh, songs for objects in the collection or staff um, anyone associated with the museum, and then those songs played in the galleries that night. It's just a test, I checked. Just a test? Okay. Great. It's going to test our resolutions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that really long, lengthy introduction is just to better set up what I'm going to talk about, which is art and social practice. So, I'm going to talk about a few things. We don't have to go back to that for a second. And I guess I will switch gears and just read, and hopefully that won't be too boring. 
for, for people. So really what I want to talk about is the emergence of art and social practice as a term, but also related historical precursors in the form of, um, that really, I think, highlight a lot of the approaches that you see people engaging with today. And I'm going to focus primarily on three things that I consider to be some of the most important factors in creating social or publicly engaged art, and that is context, relationships, and publics. And so at this point, I'm going to share that quote from Pablo Hoguera that I mentioned earlier to clarify the position. And I feel like he's done such a great job that I'm not going to try to find another way to say this, but to point to his quote here. And that is something that I encounter quite a bit, that people like to make this argument like, well, isn't all art socially engaged art? I mean, it goes out to a public. There's an audience. And I think that this is a really good way to um, clarify or argue that point. And he writes, all art, in as much as it, is, as it is created to be communicated or experienced by others, is social. Yet to claim that all art is social does not take us very far in an understanding of the difference between static work, such as painting, and a social interaction that proclaims itself to the art, that is, socially engaged. While there's no complete agreement as to what constitutes meaningful interaction or social engagement, what characterizes socially engaged art is its dependence on social intercourse as a factor of its very existence. So while there is undoubtedly uh, a multitude of reasons why people make art that is socially engaged, I'm sure as many reasons as there are artists who make that kind of work, I believe that a strong factor in why um, there's a for, uh, oh, sorry, that is throwing me off, the proliferation in educational programs that are focused on social or publicly engaged art is happening um, at places like Odo CCA, MICA, and Emily Carr, and many other programs is that these programs tend to think about alternatives to the standard studio, um, gallery, paradigm, that same system that's very hilariously portrayed here in this Dan Class comic strip from 1991 in Art School Confidential. So it, it really talks about this small and elite closed system in which very few people can actually participate. And publics are usually art audiences, right, and typically only our audiences, and that it's also largely a market-based system, which is very much related to an object-driven practice where many uh, artists are creating works for audiences that they assume are in existence, and oftentimes they're not. So rare is the pragmatist among art school professors. Only very occasionally do you come across someone who is willing to level with students about the group prospects. She says, only one student out of 100 will find work in his chosen field. The rest of you are essentially wasting your time learning a useless hobby. And every single one of them thinks, I'll be that one. And so this leads me to talking about this model of the existing artist audience relationship that was done by Stephen Willis in uh, 1973. And it kind of talks about that, that studio gallery, studio um, paradigm that I was discussing just a moment ago. And so an artist comes into a situation with their prior experience, their beliefs, all of those things. They create uh, an object, a discrete art object. They are the only ones in, in yeah, in a conversation with that artwork. And then it goes out into the world. And then how it's perceived in the world is kind of similar to the closed loop kind of experience. So an audience member comes in with their own prior experiences, beliefs, were already established. They encounter an artwork. They have a viewing loop with it. And then they go on to have their own experiences. And no one is connected. You know. The artist doesn't know what the audience experience is. They don't know the context of the situation. There is no connection between anyone knowing about each other's past experience or beliefs or the context. And there's no relationships that are being formed. And then here is a model that Stephen Willits made of a socially interactive uh, model of an art practice, which I think really, this was done in 1970, and I think that people who are still doing socially engaged art are public 
main data chart today. This is really the, the way that this system is working. The artists, the audience, the context, they're all having a dialogue with one another. And those things all inform the artwork. That there is no sort of closed, isolated um, artist sort of system happening that the context, the people involved, it all informs the artwork. That oftentimes an artwork can be created for an audience or with an audience, and that the artist is aware of all of these factors when they're creating the work. And so these are things that really highlight um, exchange, conversation, consideration, like I said, a knowledge of the audience. And it really works against this unknown public or this assumed audience. Um, this is usually a structure in which there's a built-in audience that you know that you're creating work for, for a people, for a public, with a public in a lot of cases. So what many approaches to socially engaged art propose is that art can exist in alternative systems for multiple publics, and that before, during, and after a work um, is made, publics, contexts, and relationships are considered. This by no means implies that work cannot also exist in an art context. It just means that other possibilities are possible. So the term art and social practice values both art and social practice equally. So the art value should be considered as, as important as its social value. So it also means that work should be as interesting to a non-audience as it is for an art audience. And I think that oftentimes that non-art audience is the primary audience. And I'll just sort of list the names. Oh, good. So Paul Ramirez Jonas, uh, his project Key to the City, that was around my creative time. A piece by Harold Fletcher, in which he worked with at this gas station, the Jay's Quick Gas in Portland, Oregon, where the owner Jay was a big fan of uh, Ulysses, and so they did this series of videos recorded in, in the space related to the book. Center for Land Use Interpretation, Project Row has this example from Tim Rollins and the KOS Kids Survival. Mel Chan, and then uh, an exploding school project by Newell's more men. So art and social practice is an umbrella term. The term itself is borrowed from the social sciences, which mirrors its multidisciplinary uh, practice and often excess intersects with things like sociology, anthropology, ethnography, education, architecture, agriculture, etc and describes social practices, customs, interactions, and beliefs. Uh, the Social Practice Wiki, which uh, was, I think still is, maintained by the students in the Social Practice Program at CCA, they define art and social practice um, as a medium and not a genre or a movement. And the Wiki goes on to say, quote, social practice engages any number of issues via the vast medium of the social. The social most commonly uh, includes people, their relations to one another, their relations to their surroundings, and their relations to the structures that constitute their surroundings and themselves." End quote. Art and social practice is a term that's been used more frequently um, as of late to describe social engaged art making. One example is that uh, Shannon Jackson, in her book Social Works, she refers to it as a social practice. I guess just yesterday, there was a piece in the New York Times that mentioned Justin, and they also are using that terminology as well. So just a little bit, I'm not going to go on too much about this, but a little bit of the history of the first real sort of institutionalization of the term social practice in an art context happened in about 2005, and that was at the California College of the Arts, and there was a lot of um, Bay Area artists historians, thinkers at the time using that kind of terminology, and art historian Lydia Matthews, who was working at CCA at the time, was really one of the first people to use it. And then when Ted Purvis started the social practice concentration, they adopted that term. And then two years later, uh, when PSQ started its MFA in social practice, uh, we also used that term. Interesting sidebar is that Harold was an adjunct at CA at the time, and so I think like that kind of language seeped in, and that's one of the reasons why we we use it. But I think ultimately why I like it as a term is for its openness. That unlike a lot of the other terms that you see out there, like 
relational aesthetics or new genre public art, that it wasn't someone um, like an artist or a critic or a theorist who was trying to distill this new way of working that brought together this certain group of artists that all of a sudden were like, this is it, this is the thing, that this was adopted and that it comes from this different sort of um, background and this different way of working that very much is in line with actually having a social practice. So that's one of the reasons that I, I like the term myself. And um, maybe I will, I will share this. This is the language that CCA used when they launched their program, and it'll just illustrate how much of an umbrella term it is. Quote, this new area will coalesce around graduate students and Bay Area and visiting faculty whose work spans disparate art practices such as urban interventions, utopian proposals, guerrilla architecture, and new genre public art, social sculpture, project-based community work, service dispersals, and street performance. These varied forms of public strategy are critically linked by theories of relational art, social aesthetics, pluralism, and democracy. Tied everything we could right in there. And then when we launched the program, this was some of the language that we used. Quote, art and social practice starts and ends not in rarefied spaces, but out in the world, although there are intersections with studios and galleries when necessary or appropriate. Social practice is not restricted to any medium, but instead uses various forms, methods, and approaches as the situation dictates. Any combination of media might be used in the creation of a project. And I think personally, and probably know that I go back and forth between saying art, social practice, or socially engaged art. To me, those are both just nice, broad ways of referring this kind of working. So I'm going to move on to talk about the first of the three areas that I want to discuss, and that is context. And the example that I'm going to touch on um, in each considers these ways of working to, um, uh, let's see, yeah, these examples to current modes of production as well. And I could have easily um, talked about a lot of different examples, but I very specifically just picked one example for each that I think is most emblematic of what I'm looking at. So the first example I'm going to be discussing is the Artist Placement Group. The APG was a UK-based group that was active from 1966 to 1991, and they sought to put artists in residencies, in businesses, and industry, uh, seeing the potential for new kinds of collaborative strategies and relationships. I think that uh, one of the most important things about this group is what they were really proposing was this kind of new form of patronage in which an object wasn't necessarily the outcome, but that business and industry would integrate artists into their practices. So the group was founded by John Latham and Barbara Stabini in 19, and in 1989, the APG became O plus I, which is Organization and Imagination. And as an independent international, they functioned as an independent international um, consultancy and research body. So, uh, as I mentioned, this sort of new model of patronage, and I should note that the APG was actually extremely successful in, in getting high profile placements. I mean, they had artists embedded in places like British Steel Corporation, British European Airlines, ICI Fiber, Scottish Television, among countless others. But one of the things that they were probably most criticized for uh, was almost like a lack of outcome. Like, oh, okay, well, artists are there, but are they making anything? And so I think it's important to share their manifesto because they had really very clear guidelines about how an organization was supposed to operate in conjunction with an artist, and here, here it is. So this was from 1980, and this is how the function was. One, the context is half the work. Two, the function of medium in art is determined not so much by the fact, that factual object as by the process and the levels of attention to which the work aims. Three, that the proper contribution of art to society is art. Four, the status of artists within organizations must necessarily be in line with other professional persons engaged within the organization. 
Five, that the status of the artist within organizations is independent, bound by the invitation, rather than by any instruction from authority within the organization and to long um, and to the long-term objectives of the whole of society. And then six, that for optimum results, the position of the artist within an organization, in the initial stages at least, should facilitate a form of cross-referencing between departments. So it's really important to them that artists weren't being brought in to these situations with this notion that, okay, you're going to need, at the end of this time here, what has to happen is a sculpture. Like, no matter what, a sculpture is going to happen, and it's going to be here. But instead, they really saw that the contribution of an artist could be very different, and they were really embedded in these organizations, included in meetings, able to share their perspectives, their way of working, and that that should be a valued contribution as well. Yeah. And I'm going to move on, I think, to the next example. So, the next example I want to talk about is Mira Laterman Euclides. So, Mira Laterman Euclides has been the unofficial artist in residence with the New York Department of Sanitation for now over three decades. And she's perhaps best known for the project which is shown here called Touch Sanitation, in which she shook the hands of over 8,000 sanitation workers. And Mira has such an incredible voice that I'm going to share uh, how she describes the project in her own words. Quote, I'm not here to watch you, to study you, to analyze you, to judge you. I'm here to be with you. All the shifts, all the seasons, to walk out the whole city with you. I face each worker, shake hands, and say, thank you for keeping New York City alive. And then also, uh, Oops. To share from Meryl's own voice, I want to read an excerpt from her manifesto for maintenance art, since maintenance art is such a big part of what she does. I am an artist. I am a woman. I am a wife. I am a mother. Random order. I do a hell of a lot of washing, cleaning, cooking, renewing, supporting, preserving, etc. Also, up to now, separately, I do art. Now, I will simply do these maintenance, everyday things and flush them up to consciousness, exhibit them as art. Something that I really love about Meryl is that she, she does include every single one of her children on her artist resume. It's that connected for her. So, um, she wrote those words as a young artist of the age of 30. Uh, she had just become a wife and a mother, and that these changes in her life are really what spurred her um, to go in this direction. And really, uh, yeah, I think that that's just a really amazing thing that she's been able to claim that kind of practice. So this piece is called I Make Maintenance Art uh, One Hour Every Day, and this was in 1976. And this was a performance that was exhibited here at the Whitney Museum of American Art. And for this, Euclid's collaborated with 300 maintenance uh, staff at the Bank of Manhattan. And she took forward photographs of the men and women doing routine jobs and asked them to discuss their labor as either art or work. Jobs were often discussed by the same person at different times and in different ways. Later, she exhibited the workers' narrative statements alongside pictures of their daily chores. She asked viewers to challenge the social construction of aesthetics and cultural values and define what work and art mean. So in response to a maintenance piece, actually this one um, by Meryl, David Burden reviewed her work in a very ambivalent manner. At one point in his review, he made a snide reference to the current New York City fiscal crisis that was happening in the 70s. And he wrote, if maintenance can be art, perhaps the sanitation department could call its work performance and replace some of its lost manpower with a grant from the NEA. End quote. And what I find really inspirational about Meryl is that instead of being discouraged by that review, she instead read it and thought, hmm, sanitation department, that's a really great idea. And she sent a copy of the review to the commissioner of sanitation 
and then later received an invitation asking uh, if she'd like to make art with 10,000 people. And she replied she'd be right over, and she's been, been there ever since. And I think that Meryl, uh, she's someone who, like I've mentioned, I think she's a really incredible and inspirational figure. And she's someone who, in the canon of art history, I feel has really been uh, connected to feminist art and of course, performance art. And I think what's really overlooked, though, is the importance that Meryl has had on socially engaged art. That she was someone who set up her own residency, her own context, embedded her, pra uh, her practice in this very specific context that relates her interest in maintenance to um, to that direct audience that she was collaborating with and touches on daily life and she has developed this incredible thoughtful practice that is built on strong working relationships uh, communication and ultimately respect which then brings me to the last thing that i'd like to discuss and that is publics and for this final section, I'm going to focus on group material. So these are the words of group material member Doug Ashford on the origins of their group. Group material began because as artists, we were desperate. We were desperate with the idea that our work would not be shown, or if it was, then it would be seen only as commodity. We were terrified that the complexities of our subjectivities would not be written in this world, and if they were, they could not be understood. In this way, group material was a collaboration of necessity, of money, and a rented space in the tradition of making space, a room of one's own, a gallery. So group material in their approach um, did not only create their own space, uh, which was a storefront space, which they used as a gallery to display some of um, their efforts. But I think what's really inspirational about them is their agency, and that they really did create their own publics around their work. Like they said here, and I think this is something that's really emblematic of a lot of the socially engaged artists that are working today, that it's not about waiting for a curator to come and take your work and create a context for it, or like give it uh, that sort of stamp of approval or authority that you can do that yourself. You can make your own meaning, you can make your own publics, you can create that space and make the work. You don't really have to wait for anyone to do that. And I also like that um, this this way of working as a collective, in a way your own group members become in a sense a, a primary kind of audience too. And if you're interested in those sorts of challenges and dynamics, I really suggest that you look at Julie Alt's book called Show and Tell. The history of group material, and she really picks apart a lot of what, how, how challenging it can be to work work in that way. Oh, I'm sorry, I just got I'm almost done. I just realized we're uh, running a little bit like, over time. Okay, so one of their earliest exhibitions is called The People's Choice. This was in 1979, and this to me is a moment model of socially engaged art that really still uh, happens today very often. So what they did here was they went around and they met people in the neighborhood that was surrounding the gallery. And they had these conversations around uh, art objects and meaning and relevance. And they asked people in their neighborhood to donate an object that was of significance to them. What was something that really had meaning to them? And then they displayed these objects with their uh, their stories. Okay, so just to get back here, uh, the show was produced with the idea that the objects called from their friends and their neighbors could begin a conversation on objects, value, and art through the display of objects on loan. People then valued their own experiences and lives. This, in the words of Ashford, produced an alternative archive of experiences of art and experience deduced from the beliefs of others. And so in this approach that group material took, they not only considered their storefront space, but also their city as a way to realize art publics and created interesting uh, interventions into daily life. This is one that took place in the subway. To group material, the public space of the city uh, was no more or less a site for collective reimagination than the gallery was. 
This project subculture was 2,700 placards produced by 100 artists that periodically filled the spaces for advertising. In their own words, uh, they saw the street and museum as potential sites uh, for invigorated dialogue on the nature of the appropriate place for epiphany and action, places where the census and conflict could be planned and clashes between public and private could be reconfigured. And here's another public project called Dossie Bows that was modeled after the large character posters that went up uh, during the democracy wall movement in China. So crew material was not only able to make waves in their own exhibition space and out in the streets and public during their career, they worked with many uh, established art institutions from the Whitney uh, to Dia and in doing so, challenged how those spaces themselves were also used and elevated the everyday context and placed it, placed it in a fine art context. Popular culture was made significant through their various timeline projects and in projects like democracy seen here, the gallery became activated as a site of public discussion, learning, and debate. So these models and approaches around context, relationships, and publics that I've discussed here propose not only alter alternate, uh, alternate forms of sustainability for an art practice outside of market constraints, but the multitude of ways that artists can function in the world. These are systems that propose artist agency, that artists are not waiting for curators to contextualize their work, but instead making work that emerges directly from a context. That art practice and life practice can be one and the same. These ways of working and being an artist have expanded our understanding of what that can look like. It's important to note that these artists did not necessarily create new places in the world for artists to exist, but that they merely pointed to places in our daily lives. I believe that the fairly recent interest in proliferation in art programs that focus on uh, what were termed uh, art and social practice, public practice, community-based practice, is in part because of these kinds of approaches and these ways of thinking are being taught in those systems. So, yeah, I really, I'm just going to, I think I'm just going to wrap up here and say that what I think is most unfortunate, though, is that all of the programs that I've mentioned here this afternoon is that they're all MFA programs, they're graduate level programs. And to me, this is highly problematic because I believe that an artist relationship um, and how they think about their placement in society should not be an area of specialization. And that it shouldn't be an afterthought, that it really should be a core component of the education of all artists. That art and social practice needs to be taught at a foundations level. And as much as artists are pushed to develop craft, and hone in on concepts. They should be thinking about context, publics, and also uh, their social function. And that that should really be the basis of all art education today. Thank you.